Interestingly, you're a male champion of change. Initiative inspired by the incredible Elizabeth Broderick, the former Sex Discrimination Commissioner. You have a wife who decided to wear something from the Sacred Heart op shop. <laughs> to the Brownlow? To, to the Brownlow medal, yes. um, which was probably Sacred Heart, sacrilegious yeah. probably for all the people who get caught up in the whole family. She's, no, she's got all the coverage where my suit was bought from the same place, but <laughs> she seems to have got all the, uh, the media attention about that. She did, and I'm going to go Quite there much. tomorrow because she looked absolutely beautiful. But it's making statements like that and, and linking everything we do in football to sending a symbolic message. Sacred Heart is an easy sell. You know, we're talking about the heartland of St Kilda and where would there be any dissonance for anybody in supporting an organisation that does such incredible work. But then there's the pride game yes. and I would have imagined that there was a whole lot more controversy or tension around a very gutsy decision between St Kilda and Sydney Swans to advance that initiative. Yeah, no, I think you, your observation um, uh, is spot on. I mean, certainly some of the uh, communications, the letters, the emails, the social media that we received in the lead up to that, I would classify as some of the most disturbing things I've ever, ever had the misfortune to come across. Um, but I can tell you they were, most, they were far outweighed by the um, incredibly emotive and positive um, experiences and, and, and communications that we received um, from those who were um, had the opportunity to experience football like they'd never experienced before and many of them for the first time. Uh, so uh, yeah that, I mean, that wasn't something which happened overnight and it was something which you know was building up over time but you know you talk about the mission being one of the icons of St Kilda. Well, it's no coincidence that the annual celebration of sexual diversity in this state occurs in the march down the main street of St Kilda. Um, so for us, uh, you know, St Kilda is this melting pot of humanity. It's in its brightest moments, you know, everyone is welcome to be who they are and to be themselves. And, and you have this, um, uh, you know, kind of optimistic kind of place, which is really grounded yet aspirational, and mm -hmm. and so it just makes sense for us to um, to as an organisation that's, that's seeking to kind of really be in touch with, with its heart. Um, you know, a lot of our heart lies in the place that gave birth this footy club over 140 years ago. So, yeah, the, we we think there is a natural connection there. Sometimes it's just a matter of kind of um, discovering these connections and. And and uh, so that that we think you know there's a there's a genuine authenticity around the connection um, to support um, you know the fact that all people should belong at the footy. It just so happens that the LGBTI community is one group that has probably felt the least sense of belonging at the footy. Uh, so you know it was incredibly moving for us, for our coaches, for our players for our, our people to um, be able to have such an impact in the lives of so many people with, with really what is a relatively small gesture. Mm. Two female footballers in their second week of AFL football came out a few days ago and said that they are life partners mm. and had the courage to do that. Why do you think it's been so difficult for any player currently playing the game to come out and say that they're gay? I think it. I, I think it says a lot about um, the ethos around you know footy clubs and the way in which the scrutiny is there. And um, football is such a team first game, and no player wants to be seen as bigger than his or her club. They don't know. You know, and and so you know, I think there'd be a lot of players who say, well, I, I want to be known as a. If I want to be known as a sportsman, I want to be known as a footballer. I don't want to be known as a, the, the gay footballer, you know. And um, and then what attention will that draw and put upon my club that we're not looking to have? I, so, so I, I firmly believe that it's not about the way in which a player would perceive his teammates or his coaches to react. I think that you know our, our footy clubs are full of young men who have grown up with a far greater sense of normality around um, mm. homosexuality than perhaps generations before. Uh, but I think it's about the kind of uncontrollables that sit around um, football um, mm. that I think would weigh heavily on 
a young man um, in that circumstance. I, I think it's more likely you'll see a past player step away from the game and feel to talk about you know their experience. But having said that, I, I just um, you know admire and love the the fact that there's been so many different stories that have have come out of our game in the last three months through the women's league. And, and you mentioned one of them, and, and there's been so many others, and it's just been terrific. Mm. We both know that there's no shortage of passion at a footy club. And uh, as an organisation that's growing and professionalising, what do you do, particularly in the context of having said before, you've had to make some tough decisions. What do you do where you've got someone who's all heart and with all good intent just isn't making the grade. I mean, I, I often say to people when it comes to sexual harassment and bullying, you know, intent doesn't necessarily match your impact. Mm -hmm. You could be surrounded by people in an, in an old world footy club who are full of good intent, but they just, in the context, the modern day context, they're just not the right fit. Mm -hmm. How do you do those hard conversations with people who just live and breathe and, and, and would die black, white and red? Yeah. No. Well, it comes down to honesty, doesn't it? Um, and yeah. And, and look, we've we've had those exact situations that you talk about. But and there's been you know a number of people who have who have left our business over the years. And um, I just hope that you know that they would feel that they were treated with respect and dignity in the way in which you know we we supported them through that process and and then support them into recognising perhaps what their strengths would allow them to do successfully mm -hmm. because you know we've all got strengths we've all got weaknesses and um and it's important that we you know we, we have the right opportunity to kind of ply our strengths where they're going to be most valued and and so um that's an ongoing process you know we'll always give people a go you know in different roles but um footy's not for everyone and and you know even roles within different organizations aren't for everyone and so um, you know, you want to keep developing your people, give them the opportunity to um, uh, to improve performance, but ultimately that's got to be part of a, an ongoing honest feedback loop, which ensures that people know where they stand. Okay. Do you think there's ever an assumption that for those people who do their role with such love voluntarily, that there's that we can't touch them, we don't have the yeah. right to ask people who aren't being yeah. paid a salary not to do what they do because it's not necessarily giving us the best outcomes? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I mean, there's definitely you know someone who who just gives in over and above, or their passion is on their sleeve. You know, they probably get a bit longer, maybe, to kind of improve or to, to demonstrate they're up to the job than than they would otherwise. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, footy clubs um, have got to be a broad church, and footy clubs have got so many different roles and that, that can be performed. So. You'd like to think that there's always going to be something that someone can do around the organisation that allows them to still um, uh, demonstrate their passion and still, you know, receive you know the emotive um, uh, you know benefits that they receive from the association. It just might be in a different role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're talking about, I guess, the hardest aspects of leadership, particularly when you really care about people and wanting to treat them decently. If you look back over the course of your career, which day would go down in infamy as being probably your toughest ever day? Oh, um, not one particular day comes to mind, but I've, I've had any number of, as you say, it's always the, the people issues are always the hardest and they're always the ones that weigh on you the most. You know, there's days when you're trying to you know, negotiate a, um, a deal or you know sign on a policy or argue a case but they sit back in the far distant compared to the difficult people kind of issues that you, you need to deal with mm -hmm. so um, yeah and 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 the fact is um, that you know people um, it's a it's a passion game I mean that's what makes footy great everyone's got a few and very people are very emo emotional about it and so chances are that the rational might seem kind of all there, but emotionally that doesn't add up. And I think that um, perhaps my background as a lawyer probably gives you maybe a, a thicker skin to some kind of you know conflict around those things where you can 
perhaps deal with the rationality of something and then recognise the emotion but still move on. And um, uh, But the difficulty that I find often is to make sure that you're giving enough kind of credence and respect to the emotional as opposed to just the rational. Um, that's a fine balance, I think, for any leader to do. And, you know, we, we talk a bit about the, the hearts, the smarts, the guts, you know, and recognising that, you know, as a leader, you need to be able to, you know, to play to your hearts, you need to be able to, you know, work to make smart decisions, but also have the guts to follow through. And at various times, you'll be, you'll be making decisions that reflect more of one of those domains than the other. Uh, and, um, and we've all got under pressure, we've all got kind of areas we go back to. But, you know, all smarts and guts with no heart isn't going to be great. Mm-hmm. And, and likewise, you know, the other kind of combinations of those things. So I think um, you know, having, a, a, having an, an awareness around that is important. If I can dare ask this question of a lawyer working in footy, <laughs> you've just mentioned heart. What do you think would be something that made your heart sing, either in terms of a personal achievement or just something you witnessed in the course of your career that was very special for you? Yeah, well, the moment you talked about before, I mean, what you, watching Nikki Winmar and Ty Winmar share their story ahead of the Pride game, standing, um, my wife's got a photo of um, me standing with Rowena Allen, the, the State Commissioner for Gender and Sexuality, and uh, as the teams ran out in the Pride game last year and you can see the tears in, in Rose's eyes and yeah, that's an incredibly proud moment for me in terms of pulling at, you know, the heartstrings um, in terms of, you know, so whilst, you know, the, the and, and so again, I guess whilst the challenges tend to be about the people, the kind of greatest moments are about the people as well, you know, seeing a player, you know, achieve his dream of, of um, you know, running out on the ground for the first time and, um, uh, you know, and, and so, so seeing the, the the look on the parents when they you know see the way the parents are invested in it, you know, and after a win, seeing them sing the song, watching the parents look on proudly, these are all moments. But yeah, I think um, there, there's, that's the one great thing about our game. There's plenty of moments that pull at the heartstrings. I think that's what draws us to it. Okay. Now the heartstrings. Um, I think we'd have to say by just about any measure, not to put too fine a point on it. St Kilda thus far has underachieved but we enjoy the highest engagement of any AFL football club. Engagement is on the lips of just about every client I can think of and some of them spend literally millions of dollars every year measuring engagement. What do you put that special connection down to, even though we know St Kilda fans have got a robust sense of humour? <laughs> How does that happen? Yeah, look, we, we spent a lot of time looking into that in my um, early months at the Saints, you know, we didn't just kind of want to scratch beneath the surface. We took an excavator to that and and wanted a kind of warts and all view of what was gr- what what was great about St Kilda, what was frustrating to people, um, but what did people ultimately love about St Kilda, and if we could kind of find that and to bring that more to the surface more often than the negative, then you know we were pretty confident that that was going to you know to to promote that engagement and. Um, you know, so yes, that sense of kind of black humour that exists amongst Saints fans, you know, this idea about, you know, the kind of unlucky kind of were it not for the bounce there or the rezoning there or whatever these kind of things in the history of the club. Um, yeah, yes, that's an element of what St Kilda fans um, find uh, that brings them, you know, something, some degree of commonality. But for us, you know, it was about recognising that if you've got an organisation, as you alluded, which is over 140 years old, there's only won one premiership in, in that time, it must be something more than on-field success that this club means to people. Mm. And, and that, for us, was this sense of belonging and that sense of um, connection that you have, the stories that you share from generation down. The fact that we, you know, we take what we do seriously, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. Um, the, the, this sense that... Um, uh, by, by opening the club up to that, that people, um, you know, could really celebrate that connection. And, 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 you know, our players and our coaches led by Alan Richardson have been, you know, just fantastic in, in really embracing that and recognising that their job is not just to play football, it's actually to, um, to make our people proud of their footy club. Because we all want to, we all want to be a member of a, of a place we're proud of. We all want to work at a place we're proud of. We all want to be associated with an organisation that we're proud of. Um, I, th- I think, um, you know, I, I think great 
I never like to think of footy clubs as brands, but if, if, if you think about the great brands, you know, they don't just make people feel great about the brand, they actually make people feel great about themselves. Mm-hmm. And, and I'd like to think that St Kilda Footy Club could be an organisation that makes you feel better about yourself as a St Kilda person um, because of what it means to be associated with the club. And that's, that's something which you know, is testament to you know, the work that, that, that underpins the way we try and bring our fans along on, on our journey. Okay. Uh, one of the big things, of course, in the world of organisation development is talent retention. Mm. And uh, I know that footy clubs have to strategise about how they would actually manage without a key player with serious injury or a player subject to free agency, which is something that you initiated at the, blame you, at the yes. AFL Players Association. Do you ever worry that some of your key people in your phenomenal administration team might end up becoming flight risks? And how do you try to hold on to your best people for as long as possible? I've got no doubt. Uh, you know, and um, I mean, our job is to actually, um, is to make our people you know, great and help them to, you know, find in them what are their strengths so that they can, you know, make the most of their, um, of their career opportunities. And, and, you know, if and when, you know, our people leave, to, you know, to hopefully take on bigger and, and better roles in other organisations, I think that only grows our employer brand, if you like, in terms mm-hmm. of what people feel like, I want to go and work at St Kilda because I can see that the people who work at St Kilda go on to do great things whilst they're at the club, but then when they leave. So, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's certainly um, something that, you know, we, we'd certainly try and make sure that our people are, are sufficiently motivated um, and have got the opportunity in their roles to continue to develop so that they're motivated to stay. Um, but ultimately, you know, we recognise that um, they're not with us forever. Um, and so whether you're an executive, you're a coach or you're a player, I mean, it's, um, I think what our coach um, and, our, and our football program done really well is to build a, an environment where players want to be part of. And so we haven't had um, players putting their hand and say, I want to go somewhere else. Now that'll happen because as the team builds, there'll be less opportunities for everyone at, mm-hmm. here and they'll want to look at those otherwise. And, and we recognise that and we support our people. And if we have the honest conversations, they'll leave with our blessing and they'll, you know, they'll go on and hopefully have great careers. Um, so. I think you've got to be, you know, pretty mature about the fact that people will come and go, um, but ultimately um, we are in a battle and a war for talent, and that's both on field and off field. Okay. My final question: We know that sport is a great leveller and a force for reconciliation. For some of us, it might even be therapy. or the cathartic or the grounds for a conversation between two people and a meeting of minds or the uh, opportunity for spirited debate and and tension release. But at the end of the day, if sport or the club could achieve your wildest dreams, what would they be? Oh, well, look, it's, um, you know, at that point before when when we talk about making our people proud, you know the the the, the prospect of uh, returning to Moorabbin with a second Premiership Cup um, that um, is shared with our people who feel like they've been part of a journey where they've contributed to that um, success uh, is something which we are working towards every day. Um, and that is not to say that we only define success by a Premiership Cup, because that's not the case. Um, because it's about the difference we make in people's lives every day and every week. It's about how we do ensure that um, the community that supports us is supported by the footy club. Uh, But, um, you know, uh, 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 our opportunity is to inspire people through, you know, the way we play football, the way we engage with our community and, you know, the way in which people start to feel about themselves. Um, And, uh, yeah, certainly I, I, I could see, having witnessed you know, what the Bulldogs achieved last year, that's certainly something that um, we would love to achieve um, in the very near future at St Kilda. Okay. Matt, thank you very much. Thank you, Leanne.